morning, we're going to um, stand and sing Shout to the Lord. Shelter, tower of refuge. 
if you'll stand and sing the doxology with us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So now it's time to dismiss the little ones and the not so little ones. <laughs> the little ones in age, I'm sorry, not the little ones in, in heart. All right. <laughs> In your bulletin, if I can turn this around, we have some announcements. Um, we will postpone the deacon ordination, as, as I mentioned earlier, so just look to that. I'm not sure what that date will be. Uh, um, we do have on the 19th, which is two weeks from today and Father's Day, we have our next fellowship luncheon. For those of you that aren't ever sure, it is almost always the third Sunday of the month. Um, we try to keep that pretty consistent so people can depend on it. Um, we try not to change it, but this month it will be the third Sunday. There is a sign-up. Uh, there are actually two sign-up sheets in the, in the foyer. There is a sign-up sheet just to let us know you're coming because uh, it is going to be a special meal, for, particularly for fathers that day. And there's a sign-up sheet um, for what you might want to bring. So the church will provide the, um, the, the meat, which I think is going to be a pot roast, and uh, no, not a pot roast, Martha? Just roast beef. Just roast beef. I don't know the difference, obviously, I don't cook. <laughs> the only roast beef I cook is a pot roast. So, um, but anyway, sides, uh, desserts, bread, that sort of thing, you can also sign up for that. The following uh, Saturday, we're gonna have our creation hike, which is what we're doing in lieu of uh, Vacation Bible School at um, Savage Neck Dunes from 1.30 to 3.30, and we invite families, particularly of young children, it's gonna be a kind of a nature walk, and uh, we'll have some, a guide there to help us better understand God's creation uh, in, this, uh, in this place. And then the last announcement I would make, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we also have our quarterly business meeting coming up next month. It's always the second Sunday after the quarter end, so July the 10th is the date. Uh, we encourage all members to be here to discuss regular quarterly business, and of course, non-members are welcome to um, attend and listen to what, uh, how the church operates. So the last announcement um, is we welcome Dr. Lynn Hardaway uh, to our pulpit today. He was going to be here to do our deacon ordination. Um, and uh, fort fortunately for us, uh, he was already prepared uh, to, to come, and now we're just very happy that he's able to, to come anyway and lead us in a Andrew's absence. So those of you that um, haven't met Dr. Hardaway, he has been um, an instrumental person in our church over the last few years, particularly as we've um, ordained deacons, as we've called um, pastors, as we've um, trained deacons, um, all of these things. Uh, the Bridge Network, um, which is located across the bay, uh, is just a, a great organization and has been of great assistance. And Dr. Hardaway is the, um, I believe, is it the executive director? Close enough. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but anyway, we welcome Lynn uh, to the pulpit this morning and look forward to your speech. Uh, not speech. Sermon. Sorry. Until I was in business for too long. I can make it a speech. <laughs> You're just doing everything today. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you're still chair of deacons? Yes, see, that's just, you're just doing your job, right? Good job. Well, it's good to see all of you here today and uh, glad to be here with you. And sorry it didn't work out for the deacons, but that, that's okay. We'll come back on another day. 
and uh, get that done. Well, uh, you can turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, verse 7 is where we're going to focus today. I always enjoy coming back to Eastville. You know, you folks are a lot like the people I pastor, and I saw y'all said y'all were over there uh, this week or so, some of you where I pastor, and uh, just good people, and it's, uh, it's fun to preach. I started to wear jeans. At my church, I can wear jeans and preach, but I wasn't sure, you know, because I wouldn't want to offend somebody that thinks that jeans don't belong in church, but y'all don't look like the kind that would get offended by that. At some churches, they would. As old preachers can't preach in jeans. I preach better in jeans because they're not as tight, you know. <laughs> All right, so last year, a two-year-old colt finished dead last in his first race. Disappointed, his owners placed him in a claiming race where anyone could take the ownership of the horse for a fee. An older man purchased the colt after missing the chance to claim another horse he wanted. He said it was his last attempt to find some success in the racing industry. The colt he purchased won that race by 17 lengths, and the owner was encouraged. But in the races that followed, the horse finished third twice, fourth once, and fifth once. But... His owner still believed in him. 2022 was the Colts' only chance to race in major thoroughbred races because they're limited to three-year-olds. The day before the Kentucky Derby, the field of horses was already full. There was no slots available. But at the last moment, a famous trainer scratched or withdrew his horse. The Colt took that place in a field of 20 horses, 30 seconds entry before the entry deadline. That's how, he, how close it was that he got in. Suddenly he was in the game and he had a chance. All the metrics and predictors were against him. Neither his owner, his trainer, nor his jockey had ever been associated with any horse in the Kentucky Derby. This is just such an incredible story, isn't it? His jockey had never even won a major event. They were decidedly outsiders and newbies in an extremely elite arena. On the morning of the race, his odds of winning were set at 80 to 1, the second longest odds in Derby history. Halfway around the track, he was living up to his reputation. He was 16 horses back from the lead, but he couldn't even be seen from the field of view of the drone camera flying above the race. He was a nobody, a throwaway, an inconsequential participant, but then he made his move. He began working his way through the crowded pack, finding a few narrow fleeting opportunities to improve his position. As they headed toward the finish line, he had miraculously moved up to fifth, then fourth, but still no one had noticed him. Everyone's attention was focused on the battle between the two famous front runners. Only seconds before the finish, he suddenly almost magically passed the two front runners. The announcer struggled to identify him and say his name in time. He said almost in a single breath, Rich Strike is coming up on the inside. Oh my goodness, the longest shot has won the Kentucky Derby. That is such a great story. A, a horse that didn't stand a chance finds the skill, the energy, whatever it needed to, to win the Kentucky Derby. We all love those kind of stories where underdogs uh, just come back and win. That's why a lot of you are, what are they now, the Washington Commanders? You don't even know what they're, you don't even know what they're called anymore, do you? You used to be Redskin fans, but now you're, I don't, that football team up in Washington, right? But, uh, that's, you know, and I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, sort of. I can remember when they knew what a football was, you know, and they could win games and things like that. But uh, we all like underdog stories. And uh, this, the story of Rich Strike really parallels the story, our own story. The odds against us getting to heaven were far greater than 80 to 1. In fact, we had zero chance of ever entering God's kingdom. Because we were dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead. Nobody's going to bet on a dead horse, are they? I'd be foolish. Because a dead horse isn't going to win the race, isn't going to get up and run. But God didn't bet on us. God purchased us and gave us life. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6. He gave life to those of us who were dead. In Ephesians 2, verse 7, Paul lets us cross the finish line. Those of us who were dead in trespasses and sins had no chance of ever getting into God's kingdom. Now we're there. Now we get to see what that place is going to look like. 
And uh, it says this, and Paul writes this, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So Christ purchased a bunch of dead people. Think about it. That'd be like spending money on a dead horse. That's just kind of a bad investment, right? Unless you have the skill and ability to bring them back to life and give them supernatural power. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus did. He purchased us, and the verses there ahead of this say he regenerated us, he resurrected us, he resettled our hearts in heaven, and he's in the process of retraining us to live life for him. Now, not to go too far with the parallel, but we could say that the jockey plays the role of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit plays the role of the jockey in our life. He's whispering to us. He's telling us, make this move, make that move. Give it all you've got right here. If you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life, he will make you a champion spiritually. Maybe not in the eyes of the world, but who cares what the world thinks about us, right? It's what God says when we get to heaven and rewards us for what we did. Verse 7 tells us why he did all of this. He's kind of like the, the, the owner of, the, of Rich Strike walking the horse around the track, listening to all the praise and accolades of the crowd who were just astonished at what that horse had accomplished. And uh, the investment that he made in us has paid off, and that's what this is about. So we're going to take really three quick points on this passage. And you know what an exploding diagram is? That's not a diagram that explodes on the page, but they take it and they break it all up into little pieces so that you can understand it. I used one of those once uh, my, we had a, a Sienna, Toyota Sienna van, and something inside of the sliding door had broken and it wasn't working. So I went online and I printed out the exploding diagram which showed me how to take everything off and how everything should look and how to replace the pieces and where they all went. And by following the exploding diagram, I was able to put it together and make the door work. So we're gonna do an exploding diagram of verse seven, just kind of break it into its pieces. The first piece, that you need to uh, remember is, we have a fantastic future ahead of us. Would you say that with me? We have a fantastic future ahead of us. Notice he says that in the ages to come. And you see, some people have given up and think that this life is all that there is, and that's why they're trying to get everything out of it that they can. This life, that's all they live for. It's all they know anything about. But we understand and know that there are ages yet to come in front of us. Jesus called it, John 5, 24, everlasting life. Paul labeled it in Romans 6, 23, eternal life. John said it will be forever and ever without end. Maybe that's why the writer of Amazing Grace wrote this. When we've been there in that place 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's grace than when we first begun. Now, one of the issues we have since COVID, according to statistics and surveys, is about 26% of Christians who were reading their Bibles prior to COVID are no longer reading their Bibles. I don't know what COVID did to make people decide the Bible's not anything they're going to invest their time in, but I'm on a personal crusade to get Christians back in the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, you're going to understand a lot of things about heaven, where we're going to be, who are we, who's going to be there with us, what will we be doing. In this verse, Paul tells us why we're there. Christ didn't die on the cross for your sins just so you could go to heaven and have a good time. There's more to it than that. Um, sometimes when you're in a difficult situation, if you have something better to look forward to, it makes the difficult situation more bearable. When I was uh, a young man in ministry, my first ministry job was a youth pastor in Fort Worth, Texas. And they taught us in school, and I learned from the church that reached me with, Christ, uh, uh, with the gospel, just tell everybody about Jesus. Don't worry about their race. Don't worry about their economic status or their education. Just tell everybody about Jesus. So with this little church in Fort Worth, uh, I started doing that. And teenagers started getting saved. And, and then black teenagers started getting saved. 
And this created a crisis for him. Now, this was a different time than we're living in today, but the deacons, I had to go before the deacons and explain to them why I was leading black teenagers to Christ because it put them under pressure to decide whether or not they could baptize black teenagers because if they baptized the black teenagers, those teenagers became church members. And their fear was this, I kid you not. If we baptize these black teenagers and their families start coming, they're going to take over our church. I couldn't believe I was listening to the most spiritual men in a congregation say such things. Now, this church was one of the largest missions-giving churches in our whole group, and they spent tens of thousands of dollars sending missionaries to Africa to reach black kids, black people. That's where our pastor stood up and said, gentlemen, we spend all of this money to send people to Africa so that the black people can hear the gospel, and we're not going to put Lynn on the hot seat because he's winning black people to Christ here. It created such havoc in that church, I decided it's time for us to part ways. And so a church in Hawaii called me and said, would you come be our youth pastor? Hawaii. You know, Hawaii's the other side of the world to a West Texas boy. And so I said, I'll come. Absolutely. You know what? The more I thought about Hawaii, the less I was worried about the infighting in that little white church that wanted to stay all white. didn't matter much to me anymore because I was going somewhere else. Are you following me? You tracking me here? Yeah, we got a lot of problems as a nation. I love America. I will love America till the day it dies if it ever dies. I, I love the United States. But the problems we have don't matter as much to us if we're going to heaven. We have to keep it in perspective. People are messed up in our nation. They're crazy. They've gone out of their minds. Some of the logic that they're reasoning reasoning with is just complete fallacy in logic. But I don't worry a whole lot about that. I don't worry about who our next president's going to be or who our last president was or what kind of job our current president. Now, I have some concerns, but I'm not worried. Here's why. Because the Bible says, set your affections on things above. Things above heaven in heaven, not on things on the earth. Don't get all wrapped up around this stuff and all jazzed up and excited When I see Christians get all jazzed up and excited about what is nothing more than a political antic, it concerns me. You're putting the the current crisis ahead of the fact that one day we'll be in heaven forever. Set your affection there. And so uh, he just tells them, here's what in the ages to come. One of the things that happens, one of the reasons God puts us in heaven is he wants to display the greatness of his character and his glory in a way that only salvation displays it. Uh, Let me say that again. One of the reasons he has us in heaven, it's not just because he loves us, he does, but he's able to display or show or use us as an example of his character and his glory by saving us and giving us a home there. Now, we learn a lot about God by looking at creation. I'm glad you're going on a creation walk because we learn a lot about God in what he made. I think our God is an artist, don't you? You ever see him paint a sunset that just took your breath away looking at it? Our God is an artist. We learn that. He's great at creating things of beauty. He's intelligent. I mean, what if he put us together differently as human beings? What if he made it so our nose was upside down on our face? And then every time it rained, we'd drown, right? So you, he could have put us to it, but he made us the way he wanted it. He's an intelligent designer. We learn it about from, by looking at creation. We learn a great deal about God from reading our Bibles. It tells us a lot about him. But all of the things we can learn about God by looking at this current creation and reading about him in the scriptures is so tiny and small compared to what we're going to know about him and learn about him for the rest of eternity. You might liken it to uh, 
an oak tree, you know, an acorn has gotten into the ground and a little sapling has grown up. And when you look at that sapling, you're thinking, that's pretty amazing, isn't it, that an acorn can put together a little sapling? It's kind of a cute little thing to look at. But being from West Texas, how many of you have ever been to the Great Plains in West Texas? Okay, so you just have to believe what I tell you, right? I can say anything you want to. We don't have trees in West Texas. We got bushes that are tall that they use for trees. They call them mesquite trees. We don't have trees like this. So when I'm around all the trees on the East Coast, I'm stunned at the size of these trees, the beauty of these trees. This world that we live in, we learn about God like the little sapling. But for the rest of eternity, our knowledge about God's character and glory is going to grow and grow and grow and grow forever and ever. And the more our knowledge grows, the greater glory we bring to him. So we have this fantastic future ahead of us. But look in chapter 3 and verse 9. I want you to see this because this helps us understand where the church plays, what role the church plays. To make all see, to make all see, I want, God says, I want you all to see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known, what are the next three words? By the church. Might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished. So really what he's doing by reaching us through the outreach of ministries local, of local churches is he's finding a way for all to see just how great he is. He finds dead people and brings them to life make spiritual giants out of them through his training for the rest of our lives so that one day we'll be able to uh, share that story with him in heaven. So the first thing is we've got a fantastic future. Now if you're not sure about that, do a topical study of heaven and see all the stuff. That's a whole different sermon. Second truth, we have a powerful purpose ahead of us. We have a fantastic future. We have a powerful purpose ahead of us. Say that with me. We have a powerful purpose ahead of us. Chapter 2, verse 7, Ephesians. That in the ages to come, which will be forever and ever, ever, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. God's like us. He likes to display his best handiwork. You know, uh, when kids do artwork at school, uh, down on the south side where we have malls, they, they'll put their works in malls. You can go see your kids' artwork. It's displayed. They put all this work into it. They want people to see it. That's true of animal shows. We, we have, I guess you all have on the Eastern Shore competition like 4-H and stuff. And so they put them, the animals that your children have raised on display and they give an award to the best in second and third place and because of all the work you put into it. Or how about custom cars? You guys like those? What, 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 if you could own a custom car, what would be one that you would own? Chevette. Chevette. Yeah, man. What year? 72. Yes, sir. 1955 Chevy Bel Air. That's what I grew up in as a kid. I wouldn't want it because it's the prettiest car or the most exciting car, but I got a lot of good memories with our family in that car on trips. That's what I would own. But when these guys take these old vehicles and they refurbish them, they, out do, the, they do the inside, the outside, the motor and everything, they go to these shows so that they can show other people what they've done. There's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what God does with us so he could show verse 10 his workmanship what he's done he wants to put us on display so here's kind of what it might look like <clears throat> one day uh, you and I'll meet in heaven we've known each other now for a few thousand years and uh, Jesus happens to be nearby and he says Lynn you know you haven't shared with Lewis the story 
of how I called you to preach at 16. You ought to tell him that story. Oh, well, Lewis, let me tell you, man, when I was 16, I was a drug dealer, hippie, went to youth camp, a bunch of clean-cut kids, and God spoke to my heart and said to preach, and I said, there is no way, uh, and I said it in non-Christian words, there is no way I will ever do that, not gonna do it. But through that whole message, he just kept pestering me. I want you to do it. I want you to do it. I said, I will not do it. Pick one of the Christian kids. I don't even know the Bible. Lynn, I want you to tell the story of my son to people who haven't heard. Finally, the preacher says, we're not going to give an invitation. But if God's speaking to you right now, would you just stand up and walk forward? And about that same time, I'm telling the Lord, if you're not going to leave me alone, I'll agree to it. But you're making a mistake. You ever tell God he's making a mistake? I still think sometimes he did, but he doesn't. Walk down to the front and surrender to preach. But the whole, when I walk down to the front, I'm walking like this. I'm shaking my head and I'm saying, this is a mistake. You shouldn't be calling me to be the preacher now, here where I'm telling Lewis this story in heaven, and Jesus is just grinning ear to ear, and he said, Lynn, I have a question for you. Did I make a preacher out of you? Well, maybe not a very good one, but you made me a preacher, you know, yeah. Or, not only will we tell our stories on what happened to us in this life to each other, and as the story's told, people, as we hear the stories from other people of what God did in their lives, We'll have glorified bodies and understandings, and we'll be rejoicing. Man, what a great story of what God did. And this will be people across all cultures and nationalities. And, but I think also we'll tell not just the stories of what happened to us on earth, but we'll relate stories of what has happened while we've been in heaven. And so I, I kind of wrote a, a fictional account uh, to, to give you an idea. We were holding a... a large feast at a hall on Hallelujah Highway, and we were laughing, joking, and singing, and eating, when the doors opened up and two archangels walked in, followed by Jesus. For a moment, no one said a word. It got real quiet. And then Jesus smiled that incredible smile of his and laughed out loud when he saw Simon Peter eating fish. You do know you'll eat fish in heaven, right? <laughs> Jesus, the first thing he wanted when he met with the disciples was something to eat, so we'd be hungry. Peter, he said, we had some fun times around your fishing addiction, didn't we? And Peter laughs, a hearty laugh, and replied, you taught me a few things about fishing that I didn't know. The crowd returned to their meals with one eye on Jesus. We were just so happy as he moved from one person to the next, talking with us, always with the gleam of joy in his eyes as he beheld us, knowing it was his grace and kindness that put us around the tables. Now, that's the kind of stories we'll tell about What's happened since we've been in heaven? That's Revelation 7, 9 describes similar. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples. You know those guys back at Hallmark Baptist Church that didn't want any colored people in their church? They're going to have a hard time in heaven, aren't they? Going to have a hard time. And languages standing before the throne and before they will have repented by then just and some of them are in heaven now So God's gonna make them sit next to black people in heaven I think so. <laughs> And they were crying with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb And one of the elders answered saying to me John Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And John said I'm not sure so he said to me these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and watched and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the curtain will be withdrawn and the principalities and powers are stunned. You know that crowd that watched the Kentucky Derby and they bet all their money on the first two horses? They were stunned that, the, that uh, Rich Strike won. The principalities and powers, the angels, the archangels, the creatures in heaven are stunned by God's grace that he reached down to us to save us and to put us in heaven. But we're there to witness of his glory. 
The great thing about that too is that we will have absolute purity finally done with sin. Amen? Finally done with these sin natures within us. They'll be gone. They'll have no place in heaven. And when God looks at us, he can look at us with a microscope and will find no flaw in us. That is such a privilege to be used by God to bring glory to him forever and ever and ever. And when I think about that, I think about how David responded when God told him all that he was going to do with his household. I'm going to make your house the, 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 in charge of the kingdom of Israel. And then I'm going to bring the Messiah through your seed. And David's response to God was, who am I or what is my house that this great honor should come to me? Folks, that's how we should feel about being chosen, being selected, being given the opportunity to spend the rest of eternity growing God's glory through his grace and kindness. Amen? Who am I? We're not going to, nobody's going to stand up there and say, well, I, you may not have deserved it, but I deserved it. I was a good boy. I, I was sitting with a bunch of pastors. That's what I do, right? I sit with pastors and I listen to them and try to get them to laugh. Pastors need to laugh more. And, um, we were talk we were talking about this and, and, um, I looked around the table with these five guys and said, how many of y'all grew up in Sunday school? All of them grew up in Sunday school. They grew up in church. How many of you were like good boys growing up? All five of them. I said, I don't fit with you guys at all. That's not me at all, man. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know the Bible. I'm not sure I should even be sitting at the same table as you, but you know, they understand as you do that everybody gets to heaven for the same price. Jesus didn't die more for the good people than he did for the bad people. He died for the whole world. So we've got a fantastic future ahead of us, right? Got that one? Say fantastic future. We have a powerful purpose ahead of us. Say powerful purpose. And now the third truth is this. God has made an incredible investment in us. Look what it says. That in the ages to come, fantastic future, he might show, powerful purpose, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you want to measure the value of a gift that someone gives you, measure what it took for them to give you the gift. So if you have $500,000 in the bank and you give a cash gift to someone in need of $50, now to the person who needs the money, it seems pretty valuable, but to you, $50, come on. It, it means nothing. 50 bucks is nothing. But if you're broke and it's the last $50 in your pocket, and you give it to the person who is in need, that costs you something. You following me? If you want to know the price of our salvation, look at what it costs the Father. I was thinking about D-Day and Memorial Day. and have, have any of you been to the American Cemetery in France, Normandy? Yeah. It's sobering. It's just hard to visualize 10,000 American 18, 19, 20-year-olds buried there. Now, if you want to know about the price of freedom, the price it costs to be able to worship in a building like this without the police walking in and telling you to disperse, you're having an illegal meeting, you know what that cost? It cost that young man his life. It cost his parents their son. It cost his fiance, her fiance. It cost brothers their brother, sisters their brother. You want to know what freedom is? Freedom is expensive. And our salvation is so costly, we forget how to value it. It costs the Father. Look and, listen to what it says. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son. There was a sending forth. Now, I've got a 20-year-old daughter, and she's been dating this guy for four years. 
There will never be born in this life the boy that's worthy of my daughter's love, ever. He'll never, he may think he's good enough, but he's not good enough for my girl. Now, he's a good kid, but the day is coming. Maureen and I just talked about this yesterday. They're already talking marriage. He lives down in Florida. When they finish college, they want to get married. And so we were talking, and I got really somber. And I said, the day my girl leaves our house and moves to Florida to live with that puke is going to be a hard day for me. There's a sending forth of the one you love. Folks, my love for my girl, and I love this girl, man. She's just a perfect kid. Pales in comparison to God's love for his son. But he sent him forth. So loved the world. God so lo loved the world. There's this, this giving up. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. When Christ was on the cross, if this had been my girl being tortured, and beaten, I would be like the father of the movie Taken. I don't have a certain set of skills, and I'd get the daylights beat out of me, but, but I would go find the person that was torturing her, and I would take them down. Amen? It's our kids. But God chose not to do that. He watched as they tortured his son. It says he made him to be sin for us. The thing God hates most in the universe, he made his son to be that. It costs the father, but look what it costs the son of God for us to be in heaven. Philippians 2, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. God set aside, God the son set aside his God attributes that's costly. You say, well, how does that happen? Have you ever seen an adult in the room with a baby? Here's this very dignified person. You see them out on the street, they're very dignified. They handle them. Put a baby in their presence. It's goo goo ga ga. <laughs> oh, baby, baby, pretty baby. They just set all of their adult features aside and they become like a little baby to try to, keep, you, you tracking me? God set all of his deity, not he didn't set his deity aside, but all of the features of his deity aside became one of us. It cost him. He made himself of no reputation. You know what I, I get on to preachers about this. None of them listen to me. But some guys, that stand behind pulpits believe that they're better than the people they preach to. And that they're better than, I think they're insecure, but you get around them. When they walk in a room, you gotta notice them. Everybody's gotta understand they're the most important person in the room, right? They've got this thing about it. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus made himself of no reputation and became one of us. He went through the death of the cross, all of the sin in this world. He walked in our midst. When I was a new pastor in Portsmouth, across the street from our church, there was a housing development, apartments. And I asked the people at the church, tell me about those apartments. They said, 60 Minutes came in a few years ago and decided, declared that that was the highest crime area in the United States. I said, that's just great. So what do we do? Well, we can just ignore all of those people. I mean, we don't want them coming to our church because we're good people, right? Or, as a foolish 25-year-old, I just decided to go door to door. You know, knock on their door, ring their doorbell, they'd open the door, they'd say, you're either a preacher or a cop. I said, I'm a preacher. Pastor that church right across the street. And we're, we have a van now to pick up kids. I'd love for our van to come and get your kids, bring them to church, and we'll bring them back here and drop them right off in front of your house. 
I don't remember how many apartments there were, probably 200, 250. I knocked all of them. But the things I saw when they would invite me into their house, now these people, cocaine addicts, heroin addicts, cocaine and heroin addicts don't take care of themselves and they don't take care of their houses and they don't take care of their kids. And I saw things that absolutely offended my sense of decency. And I wasn't raised a rich boy, I was raised a poor boy. And it offended my sense, not it didn't offend me, it offended my sense of decency. They fed their kids things that I would not feed to my dog. I'd see stuff on the table and I wonder, what is that slop that you're feeding these children? Kids wearing dirty clothes, runny nose, needing baths. When Jesus came into the world and walked among us, don't you think that the perfectly pure Son of God had his sense of decency occasionally offended by the lifestyles of the people that he came to save? Sure he did. It cost him. And so God has done all of this. He gives us a fantastic future. He gives us a powerful purpose. He's made an incredible investment so that we can bring glory to him for the rest of eternity. Now, Here's what the Bible says, that the angels desire to look into this. They can't comprehend that kind of love and grace that God has for us. It, it, it's amazing to them that God would give us the time of day. He not only gives us the time of day, he gives us the rest of eternity to spend with him. The angels are amazing. In fact, it says, be careful because sometimes you entertain angels when you're not even aware of it. Of course, angels visit your service. They're right here today. You can't see them, but occasionally one of them will walk in in a bodily form and you better be careful how you treat them. They might just be a black person. <laughs> Serious. You be careful how you entertain strangers in your church because angels do visit. Now, they don't glow a few times in our services. I've met guys, it's always guys for me, but I've met guys that I was convinced the way things happened, they probably were angels. Well, I remember one time two guys sat, I talked to them before the service because they were guests and they're standing together, young fine-looking men, and I said, where are you from? And they looked at each other and said, Portsmouth, and we started the service, and they sat back in the back on the back row. Now, I watch you when I'm preaching. I don't know if you know that. If you go to sleep, I know. <laughs> so you learn how to sleep with your eyes open. You learn how to do it. But they watched the crowd the whole time I preached. They didn't look at me. They watched people. I thought, that's kind of odd. That day... When I gave the invitation, we had 10 adults. This was a church that ran about 80 or 90 at the time. We had 10 adults walk, the front, walk to the front to receive Christ as their Savior. I was elated. You, see, you know, so imagine 10 people in your church right today. Suppose we gave an invitation and you had a bunch of guests and 10 adults. I love children getting saved, but when an adult gets saved, that's, that's, that's hard to accomplish. Imagine 10 people walking forward and saying, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. I was so excited, and I looked back in the back. We hadn't even dismissed. Those guys were gone. They just disappeared. Now, whether they walked out a side door, I don't know. But angels do come. So they're interested in what we have to say. So that's, that's the whole gist of the message today is to help you understand that we have a fantastic future ahead of us and a powerful purpose because God has made an incredible investment in us. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Is it your tradition to give an invitation song or just to pray? The invitation song is great. They'll, they'll do that after communion, though. After communion. Yes. Oh. So we're going to pray and then have communion. Yes. Thank you. See, that's, I've got I to gotta stay with your tradition or I'll, y'all won't know what to do with yourselves if I get up. Well, let's pray together then. Father, we're so thankful for your goodness and grace, the riches of your kindness toward us. May we as your people just go away from here rejoicing in the fact that even though this world is really, really messed up right now, you're not messed up. And our heavenly home is safe and secure and will never be anything like the mess that we have here. 
And Lord, may we walk away from here with praise and worship for your goodness in our lives. And we'll thank you for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Oh, I went four minutes over time. I'm so sorry. Now we'll have communion. And do I stand behind the table? Can we move the table forward? Because I'll never fit in that six inches. Just move it forward just so I can stand back here. Okay. Very nice. Now we have the deacons come forward. Oh, you are the deacons. Can you do this with just two people? Okay. Father, we're thankful for the body of Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you chose to suffer for us because you love us. And Lord, our hearts respond to you with praise for this as we remember your death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, you want me to take one too, don't you? So that night when he had prayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And we remember him with joy. Amen. And Lord, thank you for your blood that you shed for our sins, that you, you cleanse us completely uh, uh, through your shed blood. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same manner, when he had sipped from the cup, he said, Take and drink. This is my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you do this, 
do it in remembrance of me. And Lord Jesus, we take this and drink it with joy as we draw from the well of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Now what do we do, Melody? An invitation. All right. Let's stand. If God's moved upon your heart today, spoken to your heart, and you feel so moved, if you'd like to come to the front and pray, we'll make that available to you. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. And we just have it in silence. We're going to have a closing song. A closing song after the invitation. Okay. Well, we'll do the closing song. So let's take just a moment with our heads bowed and eyes closed, and if someone would like to come to the altar, you're welcome to come. All right, what's our closing song? Hi, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Oh, good song. <clears throat> Hey, but let me tell them a story real quick. Sure. So I went fishing this week, right, in a guy with his boat, and we were fishing under a bridge. So I'm sitting next to the motor. He says, well, Lynn, why don't you just, let's get out further down the, down the creek here and float back to the bridge. So I start the motor right up. I give it some gas, and the boat just runs right over and hits one of the pillars under the bridge. I said, I don't know what's wrong. I'd go the other way. It hits one of the pillars on the other side. He's looking at me like, are you, are you stupid? I said, I don't know what's wrong. He looks over and he hadn't pulled the anchor up yet. He pulled the anchor up, we got out of there fine. So one way to sing this song is, my anchor's up, my chains are gone, we can be set free, amen? Do you like that story, Ed? Okay. <laughs> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I'm My 
chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever.